And so here we are in chapter 9.2, and we're talking about oxygen requirements. Requirements uh, for microbial growth. <clears throat> and we've already spoken quite a bit about this, uh, but we're going to put some specific terms out there now. And so we've spoken about this because we talked about aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. So remember, aerobic respiration, aerobic respiration is when we use oxygen as the final electron acceptor. <clears throat> and if we have anaerobic respiration, then that's when we have something other than oxygen, another inorganic molecule as the final electron acceptor. Uh, that's not oxygen. Um, and then, of course, we talked about fermentation. <clears throat> and so we have already spoken about these, which means, of course, that we have different microorganisms that go through aerobic respiration, others that go through anaerobic, some that go through fermentation, or some that go through a mixture of these things. Um, so when we talk about oxygen requirements, of course, if we're talking about aerobic respiration, so an organism that only does, let's say, aerobic respiration, that means that they need oxygen in order to go through their process of making ATP. On the other hand, if we have an organism that uh, say cannot be exposed to oxygen or just doesn't use oxygen, that's because they go through anaerobic respiration. Um, so they don't have to be exposed to oxygen. And in fact, that's how most or how the world was for a very long time, um, was there was not oxygen that was in the environment all the way up until something called the oxygen revolution. Oxygen revolution. <clears throat> And so this is when um, the Earth kind of got to a point where oxygen was released and it stayed in the atmosphere. So prior to this, <clears throat> there was iron um, that was holding on to whatever oxygen was produced. Um, so for example, if at this point we're most of, mostly a water world. Um, so we're talking, we're talking about cyanobacteria. So there are cyanobacteria. Remember, cyanobacteria go through aerobic or um, produce oxygen, rather. Um, and since they produce oxygen <clears throat> in the past, in the historical time, cyanobacteria began to release oxygen as a byproduct, as a byproduct of photosynthesis. Right, so cyanobacteria is a water microorganism hangs out in the water, but it goes through photosynthesis. Remember, one of the byproducts of photosynthesis is oxygen. And so cyanobacteria is, you know, replicating and, and duplicating, going through its growth process. And as it's doing this, it's going through photosynthesis, which is releasing oxygen into the environment. Um, now, there was at the time lots of iron around, and that iron then is going to attach to that oxygen. And so it's going to basically take that oxygen out of the environment um, and make it not accessible for any other organisms. But at, at a particular point in time, <clears throat> the capacity for iron to hold on to oxygen was filled. So iron was filled with the oxygen, meaning that all of the iron that was kind of around or accessible all was attached to oxygen. And so then at that point, <clears throat> our oxygen levels increased in the atmosphere. So oxygen levels in at this here increase. <clears throat> so because iron is no longer allowed or no longer around to tie up oxygen because it's already full, now we have an increase in oxygen in the atmosphere, which at first killed off lots of organisms. Um, it killed off lots of organisms because many of them are obligate anaerobes. And being an obligate anaerobe, meaning obligate, meaning obligation, there's an obligation to, meaning they have to, and then anaerobes, meaning that they have to go through anaerobic respiration or that they are not able to be exposed to oxygen. So they are obligated to be away from oxygen. Um, that is what existed in, on Earth. 
Um, so all of these obligate anaerobes were existing on Earth, and so then when cyanobacteria was producing this oxygen, and then iron was filled up, and the oxygen level started to increase in the atmosphere, lots of organisms that then found themselves exposed to oxygen died off. <clears throat> Those that could handle oxygen then, of course, stuck around, and then we had evolution that then, you know, builds us up to, you know, humans now, but also other microorganisms. So why is it then that oxygen was causing this problem? So why were there organisms that were dying off? That is because of what are called reactive oxygen species, or ROS. <clears throat> So with the ROS, or reactive oxygen species, these are unstable molecules, unstable molecules, or ions, that um, are from the partial reduction of oxygen. So from partial reduction of oxygen. And these reactive oxygen species, so they're unstable, um, which means they're trying to grab or um, interact with electrons. And they're from the partial reduction of oxygen. So if an organism partially reduces oxygen, then it can create these reactive oxygen species, uh, which then can damage molecules. And can damage molecules. And when we're talking about damaging molecules, we're not just talking about oxygen or this uh, reactive oxygen species damaging molecules in an anaerobic uh, microorganism. We're actually talking about these reactive oxygen species um, damaging molecules in any organism. So I think the text says almost universally. So reactive oxygen species. So... Some examples of reactive oxygen species is a singlet oxygen, which is, yeah. and then we have a superoxide, which is O2 minus, and then we have peroxide, which is a big one, and then a hydroxyl radical, which is OH with an electron. And then the last one is hypochlorite, which is OCl minus. <clears throat> so these are the reactive oxygen species, or ROS, that you should be familiar with. We call these colloquially, um, as human beings, free radicals. Um, that's what they've been termed in general terms are free radicals, but technically they're called reactive oxygen species. So now that I've said free radicals, you probably recognize that you've perhaps heard something about free radicals and know that they are bad and maybe didn't know why they're bad, but if you have not taken um, chemistry, the reason that they are not good for us or they, are, they can be damaging to molecules is because of this electron out here, this extra piece, uh, this extra piece. Um, there are these kind of space, uh, these spaces that are available. And so it's trying to interact with another electron. And so in these uh, molecules or these ions, as they are in the body, they are kind of bouncing around and they're doing whatever they can to try to grab electrons to make themselves more stable. And as they're going around trying to grab electrons to be more stable, what they're doing then is they're taking electrons from other molecules, which is damaging other molecules. So this is why we say um, our free radicals are bad, is because they can. They can go around damaging things. Um, so it's important to not have free radicals. Now, us as humans, we can do different things to try to decrease the damage from free radicals. Um, but free radicals will always be formed if aerobic respiration is happening. So um, not only is it just by exposure... Um, exposure to oxygen, but aerobic respiration. Remember if we, uh, when we spoke about why one would do aerobic respiration or why they would do anaerobic respiration, um, we said that for aerobic respiration, 
is that they have to be able to break down those free radicals that are produced. So it was the cell lacks the genes to combat these oxygen radicals. And now this is what we're talking about. These are the oxygen radicals we are talking about that are produced during aerobic respiration. Um, so these are specifically produced, which means that the body has to somehow get rid of them, somehow make them so they're not toxic and damaging other molecules. So some organisms can do that and some organisms cannot. So how do we determine this in the laboratory? Uh, so if we look at our oxygen requirements, <clears throat> one of the ways we can do this is by using a thioglycolate tube. So a thioglycolate tube has a, um, a broth but can have some agar, so a little bit kind of a thinner agar or a thicker broth, if you can say that. Um, it is within a test tube. And then it can be autoclaved in order to, one, sterilize it, but two, get rid of all of the oxygen in the medium. Um, another way that you can get rid of the oxygen in the medium, however, is by boiling it. So you can boil it for 15 to 20 minutes, and then that will boil out all of the oxygen. Um, and then that thioglycolate tube can be inoculated with an organism. And as the thioglycolate tube is in the particular temperature incubator, oxygen is going to start to come into and infiltrate that medium. Um, and as it does this, so we have our, our test tube with our broth in it, and we've boiled it so there's absolutely no oxygen inside of the broth. Then once we inoculate it, we can use our loop here and we inoculate it. We put bacteria all over. Um, then remember when we incubate test tubes, we always want to have the test tube lid kind of loose. <coughs> Now that test tube lib lid is loose, which allows oxygen to get into the test tube. It also allows gases to get out, which is the main reason why we do that, um, so that any byproduct, any gas byproduct from the growth of the organisms is not going to be trapped in the tube and then break the tube uh, or explode the tube. So we leave that open, allows the gases to get out, but that allows oxygen to get in. So for the thioglycolate tube, what we then see is if, our oxygen is in blue, let's say, then it's going to start to get into our thioglycolate medium here. And as it does this, then what we're going to see is that there will be more and more oxygen near the top, of course, as it's coming in here, more and more oxygen at the top, and then it's going to become less and less as it moves down, uh, as we move down the tube. <coughs> And all of the while, we have our bacteria that we inoculated, and that's our red ones here. And so then, depending on the type of bacteria, we're going to see different growth patterns. Um, so I guess I should back up here and write about the thioglycolate tube. Um, so the thioglycolate tube, or culture, we're going to talk about those patterns in just a moment and what we call them. Uh, so the thioglycolate tube is going to be, you mix the thioglycolate, um, which is highly reducing, and you mix it with a little bit of agar and you autoclave it. So mixes thioglycolate, which is a highly reducing um, medium, and then it's mixed with agar, perhaps a little bit of agar. Actually, in our laboratory, we just use broth, so it can be mixed with agar, um, and then is autoclaved or boiled. And oftentimes, you know, in a laboratory, you would autoclave them. Um, you would autoclave them once they come down to temperature and they come down to pressure, then take them out and then you would use them. Uh, the reason that I say boiled is because you can autoclave all of these thioglycolate tubes, but then remember we can store our media for up to three months for most of them. So if we're storing the thioglycolate tubes and they're sitting in the refrigerator, for example, um, over time, oxygen can get into them, just working its way through the cracks of the lid. Um, it's going to start to have some oxygen. And then if that's the case, you're not going to get an accurate uh, reaction happening or an accurate representation of where the organism is going to grow. Since that's the case... Um, what we can do, instead of having to go through the process of autoclaving them again, then you can get a hot plate. You can put a beaker on the hot plate, <clears throat> fill it up with water, get that beaker boiling, and then you can put the thioglycolate tube into that boiling water beaker. 
Uh, you wouldn't put the thioglycolate tube directly on the hot plate. Um, and plus that would be really difficult since it's a little tube. So if you do that, then you need to boil for 15 to 20 minutes. And then of course that's going to boil out all of the oxygen. So then again, your thioglycolate tube is not going to have any oxygen in it. Um, so then what this is going to do is it's going to allow for slow diffusion. Allow for slow diffusion of oxygen. Okay, so now we take our thioglycolate tube. It's been autoclaved, boiled. Um, now what we're going to do is we are going to inoculate it with bacteria and then incubate. And then the organisms are going to grow at a level with the best amount of oxygen for them. So organisms grow at level with the best amount of oxygen for them. All right, so let's take a look at our different options here. So I'm going to draw some test tubes here. And we are going to talk about our different organisms. Okay, so I'm going to mark in yellow the top of our broth here. So here's the top of our broth, <clears throat> and in red is going to be our uh, bacterial growth. So we have our thioglycolate tubes, and then we autoclave them or boil them. They're now available for us to inoculate them. So when we inoculate thioglycolate tubes, we're going to take that inoculating loop, <clears throat> and we can put the inoculating loop that has already picked up some of our stock organism, put it down into the bottom of the tube and kind of swirl your way up to the top of the tube and then you can take it out. Um, after you do that also you can take the test tube in two hands kind of like you were clapping. Um, so you put the test tube between your two hands if you were clapping and then roll it back and forth. Uh, move your hands back and forth and roll it to kind of disperse that bacteria after you have inoculated it. But what you absolutely do not want to do is you do not want to shake it in any way because what then you would be doing is you would be introducing oxygen into the test tube, which is what you do not want to have happen at all. So we've inoculated it. Now we have incubated. And now what we see is a whole bunch of growth right here. So if I see a whole bunch of growth right at the top, now, what kind of oxygen requirements would that organism need or have? If it's at the top, remember we have lots of oxygen coming in. If it's at the top, then we have a lot of oxygen there at the top. And if that's the only place that these organisms are going to grow, then they're going to be what are called obligate aerobes. So obligate, meaning obligated or have to. <clears throat> so obligate aerobes, they cannot grow without oxygen. So obligate aerobes, aerobe meaning oxygen. So these are the ones that are going to go through aerobic respiration and aerobic respiration alone because they are unable to go through any other way of metabolizing because if they don't have exposure to oxygen, then they die. So these are obligate aerobes. Now in the second test tube, <clears throat> we have organisms that grow let's see, up here. So a lot of growth up here. And then we see some growth, but it kind of tapers off. So what kind of organism or what kind of oxygen requirements would that type of organism need? So again, there's more oxygen at the top, less at the bottom. And if an organism can grow really well in the presence of oxygen, like up here, um, but can still grow where there's very little oxygen, 
then likely this organism can do both aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration because they have to be doing aerobic respiration up here because <clears throat> there is so much growth in that area, um, more growth in that area than in other areas. And remember, with aerobic respiration, we get more ATP than with anaerobic respiration or fermentation, and so there's more growth. So we see more growth up there, and then it tapers off as we get down lower, which means that they go through aerobic respiration, but if they don't have access to oxygen, they can still grow, which means they can switch from aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration. When an, organ, an organism can do that, this is called facultative anaerobe. It is a facultative anaerobe. And what that means is that they thrive in the presence of oxygen, thrive in the presence of oxygen, but will grow without oxygen. So, but will grow without oxygen. So remember then they can do anaerobic respiration or fermentation. So then in our next test tube, if we see that there is about uniform growth over the whole thing. <clears throat> now, what does that tell us? So that tells us that this organism can be exposed to oxygen, but unlike the one that we just saw, it doesn't thrive in oxygen because we don't see a whole lot of growth at the top, especially not compared with the rest of the tube. So in this case, then oxygen is present, but it doesn't seem to be ma making much of a difference between how the organism is growing at the top here compared to the bottom, because it's pretty much uniform. It also means that they can do some form of anaerobic respiration or fermentation because they can grow at the bottom. So this organism is actually called aerotolerant anaerobes. Aerotolerant anaerobes. And aerotolerant, meaning oxygen tolerant, so they can grow at the top here. Oxygen isn't going to kill them um, because they have uh, enzymes to take care of those ROSs. But it is an anaerobe because it grows without oxygen. So it does not use oxygen at all. It doesn't do aerobic respiration. It goes through anaerobic respiration or fermentation. Um, so it's a final electron acceptor if it does anaerobic respiration. It's something other than oxygen, which means that it doesn't really matter that oxygen is there. Now, in the case of an aerotolerant anaerobe, what this means is that they do have enzymes that are necessary to break down those reactive oxygen species. And we know that because they can exist in oxygen even though they don't thrive in oxygen or grow very well in oxygen. So we would say that they are indifferent to oxygen. <clears throat> and then a lot of times we th see these as fermenters. A lot of fermenters are aerotolerant anaerobes. So then the next test tube <clears throat> will say that the growth ended up looking like this. So a pretty thick amount of growth right here. What does that tell us about this organism's oxygen requirement? Well, it tells us that it needs to be close to the surface, right? We've got oxygen up here, but it, it's not all the way up on the top surface here. So it's not thriving or growing at all in an area that has high oxygen levels, but in this area here, we've got a little bit lower oxygen levels. Um, and it's thriving, but like down here, we have really low oxygen levels and it's not thriving. So this organism is actually called a microaerophile. Microaerophile. And microaerophile, as the name implies, micro meaning a small amount, and then aero, oxygen file. So it can use um, oxygen, so it goes through aerobic respiration, but it needs small amounts of oxygen. So our microaerophiles require about 1 to 10 percent oxygen, but in the environment we're at about 21 percent oxygen. So it needs to be much lower than at just the regular environment or the top of the thioglycolate tube. 
So then our last tube looks like this. <clears throat> lots and lots and lots of growth at the bottom, the very, very bottom, but not growth anywhere else in the tube. So what does that tell us about our oxygen requirements? Right, it means that they cannot grow when oxygen is present, fully present, and at any other point down here where there might be some oxygen, it's unable to grow. That makes this an obligate anaerobe. And it's an obligate anaerobe, meaning obligate, meaning it has to, and then anaerobe, me, meaning be without oxygen. So it cannot grow where oxygen is present. So it only grows at the very bottom of the test tube. Um, so cannot grow with oxygen present. And so this is because they'd be killed by the oxygen or the reactive oxygen species. Um, so it doesn't have the genes required to help. All right, so if I scoot this up a little bit, the book did mention some examples for these, um, just some kind of major examples. So as far as obligate aerobes are concerned, some examples would be mycobacterium tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Um, so an obligate aerobe, meaning it has to have oxygen. Um, we often see these things on skin and in the air. So another example is Micrococcus luteus. Micrococcus luteus, uh, which we'll use in the laboratory quite a bit. <clears throat> Some examples of obligate anaerobes over here. Um, these are going to be things that are in the deep soil, for example. These are going to be in dead tissue because there's no blood supply, and if there's no blood supply, there's no oxygen supply. We also find obligate anaerobes in the intestines of organisms, including ourselves. <clears throat> but we also see pathogens as in clostridium species. So clostridium species are dangerous because of clostridium difficile, for example. Clostridium difficile is an organism we will talk about in future chapters because it is a very important organism because it can cause many deaths. It can cause death very quickly to some people. It's an opportunistic organism, meaning that if somebody's immune system is already down, meaning um, due to fighting off another infection or is down due to stress or something like that, that C. difficile will come in and it'll take advantage of the organism at that time and cause serious illness. Another example of an obligate anaerobe is Bacteroides. Bacteroides. And then we have our facultative anaerobe, which is kind of in the middle here because it can switch between being an aerobe over here and being an anaerobe over here. And where we find some facultative anaerobes <clears throat> are in our intestines and also our respiratory tract. So kind of in this area where um, there can be a difference between having oxygen or not having oxygen, depending on the location. Uh, and so some of the organisms we see here are, are Staphylococcus. So when we talk about Staphylococcus, we can also think this is on the skin. So there are some areas of our skin that don't get a lot of oxygen, so they can switch to facultative. Um, some areas of our skin, they get more oxygen, and that's okay. And then Enterobacteria. So our Enterobacteriaceae. And these are the ones that we find in the gut and respiratory tract. So if we have some of these organisms that are obligate anaerobes or facultative, and we need to grow them in an environment without oxygen, there are a couple of ways that we can do that. So we can use something called an anaerobic jar and in an anaerobic jar, it's a, it's a container, a jar, uh, that contains these chemical packs. And then once you activate these chemical packs, then they go through and they absorb all the oxygen and release carbon dioxide. So jars containing chemical packs to absorb oxygen and release carbon dioxide. <clears throat> 
So it's getting rid of the oxygen in this jar, and then within this jar also are your samples. Then there's also an anaerobic chamber in order to be able to work with some of these organisms without killing them. Um, this is an enclosed box, enclosed box that is similar to a fume hood, um, but instead of it being a fume hood, um, you just have these gloves that can stick into the side of the box so that you can work with this organism, but you're not actually opening up the box and allowing oxygen to get in. So an enclosed box from which oxygen is moved, removed. <clears throat> okay, so then there are a couple of other terms here. One is called optimal oxygen. As its name implies, this is the level of oxygen that is ideal for an organism. There's also the minimum permissive oxygen. So minimal permissive oxygen level. And as this name implies, this is the minimum amount of oxygen that this organism can handle. <clears throat> so our optimal oxygen, I'll say concentration, and minimum permissive oxygen concentration, and that again is the minis minimal amount of oxygen that allows growth. Then we also have maximum permissive oxygen concentration. And of course, this is the highest amount of oxygen that an organism can tolerate. So when we are talking about what works for an organism, between this minimum and this maximum, this is the oxygen range in which a microbe will survive. So, um, if we move on to these reactive oxygen species, we've said so far that obligate aerobes have the ability to get rid of these reactive oxygen species, and then we've also said that some organisms cannot get rid of them at all, and that's why they can't do aerobic respiration, and that's why they can't grow in the presence of oxygen. So, organisms get rid of these reactive oxygen species utilizing three different enzymes. So detoxification of ROS, reactive oxygen species. And so there are three main enzymes. The first one are peroxidases. As its name implies, it is going to detoxify <coughs> peroxides. Um, so it's going to limit damage caused by peroxidation of membrane lipids. Uh, so we have a molecule um, which is something like this, but it's typically NADH. And then this is going to react with our hydrogen peroxide. And this is going to then go to an oxidized version of this molecule here, plus two water molecules. So we have just an oxidized version of this molecule here, or an oxidized version of NADH, and then we end up with two water molecules. So we've effectively gotten rid of this hydrogen peroxide uh, that's again, can be bouncing around our bodies, trying to grab onto other electrons, causing problems. The second one is called superoxide. <coughs> dismutase, or SOD. Um, so superoxide dismutase, this one um, is not for peroxidases, but is for that super, or is for that um, superoxide anion. So limits damage by the superoxide anion. <clears throat> 
So in this reaction, we have two molecules of the superoxide anion, and then that is going to be added to water. Here's the two. <clears throat> then what that changes into is hydrogen peroxide plus oxygen. So you can see here that superoxide dismutase, um, what we can do is we can take this superoxide anion that is formed um, and utilizing hydrogens can turn it into hydrogen peroxide and then oxygen. So the oxygen, of course, is there um, and needs to be released. And then we also have the hydrogen peroxide. So in this case, hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide at this point can then be broken down by some of these peroxidases or our third enzyme, which is called catalase. So catalase is going to then break down or detoxify hydrogen peroxide. This is where we see two hydrogen peroxide molecules being changed into two molecules of water and oxygen. So when we talk about obligate anaerobes, <clears throat> they lack all three of these enzymes. So obligate anaerobes lack all three enzymes. When we talk about something that's an aerotolerant anaerobe, aerotolerant anaerobe, then what we're talking about <clears throat> is them having SOD but not catalase. So they have SOD but not catalase. So they can get rid of this superoxide anion because they have SOD, but then it ends up with hydrogen peroxide. So then this hydrogen peroxide will not be broken down by catalase, but will have to go and be broken down by some other peroxidases. <clears throat> so some examples of, are of different types of oxygen requirements in, in genera, actually, are... Staphylococci, Staphylococci, Staphylococci are actually facultative anaerobes. So remember that can switch between aerobic respiration when there's plenty of oxygen to anaerobic respiration or fermentation um, when it is not in the presence of oxygen. So we have our Staphylococci species, but then our Streptococci species <clears throat> is aerotolerant. So these would be aerotolerant anaerobes. And in the case of our streptococci, our aerotolerant anaerobes, these organisms have no catalase. And the reason that we have noted this is for this reason. We can do something called the catalase test. <clears throat> so the catalase test is where you can drop some hydrogen peroxide on a slide, just our typical 3% hydrogen peroxide on a slide. Then what happens is you can grab your culture and inoculate that hydrogen peroxide or, or place some culture on, place culture or sample into H2O2. So you can take your inoculating loop and then kind of swirl around in the hydrogen peroxide. If bubbles are present, so if bubbles are present, then that means that they are catalase positive. If bubbles are not present, then that means that they do not have catalase. So we can do this test. And if bubbles are present, if we're trying to decide between Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, then that means that 
if there are bubbles, that there's oxygen gas present. And if there, are oxygen, if there is oxygen gas present, and it's an organism that is catalase positive, it's just going to go into um, the catalase enzyme or be utilized by the catalase enzyme, and then it's going to be converted into water and oxygen. On the other hand, if we do see bubbles, then we don't have catalase, which means we get a really big buildup of hydrogen peroxide, um, creating all of these bubbles, lots and lots of bubbles. So lastly, we're going to talk about <clears throat> some other ways to grow these or other ways that are necessary for growing some of these organisms that need low oxygen. Um, so another way that we can grow them is in something called a candle jar. Now a candle jar is actually for specifically for capnophiles. <clears throat> so a capnophile is a bacteria that grows best with high amounts of carbon dioxide and low amounts of oxygen. So grows best. So grow best at high amounts of carbon dioxide. So this means low amounts of oxygen than in the atmosphere. So when we are trying to incubate and grow up these organisms, then we want a high carbon dioxide environment, a low oxygen environment, which is what we find in the candle jar. So inside the candle jar, this is a jar that has a very tight lid, and then you put the cultures inside it, and then you can put either a candle inside it or a chemical pack. And what the chemical pack does is it interacts with the oxygen um, and converts it into carbon dioxide. Uh, so there's a little jar that's very high with carbon dioxide, very low in oxygen, and they grow very well. So the candle jar is a jar with a tight lid so that oxygen doesn't get in, of course, with cultures and either a candle or a chemical pack, which is what is most often used now. So it has a candle in it or a chemical pack. And then what this does is it these the candle, of course, or the chemical pack is going to use the oxygen in the jar and then release carbon dioxide. <clears throat> so you put this little pack in there, you oftentimes you get the pack wet, and then it starts to go through a chemical process of using oxygen and then releasing carbon dioxide. So inside of the candle jar, it has a very high amount of CO2, low oxygen, and then we get some organisms that grow best in that situation.